Good morning. So I want to talk to you about some C words, conversions. Sales is the area that I deal with. No matter how creative you are, no matter how many ideas you have, you don't get to do them until the customer says yes. And then according to Johnny, don't just get the deposit, get the whole payment, right? I want to do that. So I want to talk to you about C's. And I love this. Do you love this? This over here? Have you ever seen anything like that? I've never seen anything like that. That was amazing when that showed up. My wife says there's no living with me because I got to hold the sign in the middle. So there we go. You can tell her tonight. So you've heard this phrase, sail the seven seas? I want to give you a little different version of that. How about we sail the seven seas? I'm trying to be creative. It's okay. So the seas are conversion. Conversion is the key. At every stage in the sales process, we need to get people to take another step. That's what conversion is. You know the relay races, right, Stuart? You know the relay race. You take a, a baton, you give it to the next runner, right? We pass to the next runner. At any point in the sales process, if someone drops that baton, the sale is over. That's it. It's never going to happen. So conversion is just getting someone from where they are to wherever they're going to go next, whatever that next step is. So the first of the seven C's of conversion is going to be to catch their attention, right? There's actually four steps in any sales process. We need to get their attention. We need to get the inquiry. We need to have a conversation. We need to make the sale. Doesn't matter what you're selling. Planning services, design services, photography, catering, doesn't matter. Those are the same four steps. Your business, my business, all exactly the same. So we need to get their attention. If we don't have their attention, and in this world, it's hard to get someone's attention because we're so scattered. So getting their attention. You have to use an aspirational image. An aspirational image is an image that shows the results of doing business with you. You're not selling stuff. You're not selling products and services. You're selling the results. They don't care about how you get there. They care that you did. You go out to dinner, you sit down at a table, that table is fully dressed. There's plates, there's silver, there's glassware. Did you give any thought to how that happened? No, because it's supposed to be that way. So they don't care, and their guests, maybe you'll wow them, but the guests, they really don't care. They care about the results. So show the results in your photos, when you can. I understand with celebrity clients, right, Jay-Z, we can't. Right? If, if Jay-Z has Jay-Z, you can't show Jay-Z in the photo, right? So there you go. But you want to show the results. Now, you look at a photo like this. Who could take credit for that photo? The florist, right? The, the celebrant? Who sold her the dress? Who made the dress? His clothing? The venue? Right? The chairs? The rental company? Right? All of these companies could take credit with that photo, which is great because we want to show those photos. If you're the rental company, you're the hire company, I don't want to see the empty chairs. I want to see why they needed chairs in the first place, which is the wedding, the bar mitzvah, the, the grand opening of their business, whatever it is. Show people having a great time. Show people enjoying the results of what you do. Or show these guys. I love those guys, right? But somebody made that happen, right? Somebody made that happen, so show me the results because it's the touching the heart, not the head, that's gonna make the sale. So, where are they looking for you? You need to get their attention, so where are people looking for you? Well, they could be looking for you in search engines, right? They could be looking for you in a search engine. You need to optimize your website first for the people that are coming then optimize for the search engine. If you optimize for the search engine first, what you end up with is a website that sounds like, you know the movie Rain Man? Remember the movie Rain Man? Definitely, definitely, do you definitely remember the movie Rain Man? Definitely? <laughs> Those of you that don't know that. I was in Philadelphia one time, and I was sitting next to a caterer, and I'm reading their website, and it said, if you need the best catering in Philadelphia, then you need Philly's best caterer, because people in Philadelphia who need catering go to Philadelphia's best caterer. And I looked at this 26-year-old kid sitting next to me and I said, dude, <laughs> do you speak like that? When you're in a conversation, do you actually speak that way? Because if I read the words on your website, it should sound like you. And you have a brand and you have a voice. Just like every, every store has a voice. They have a different voice. If I go to Harrods, it has a different voice than Marks and Spencer, right? It's a different voice. What's your voice?
If I read your website out loud, I should hear your voice. So it's like people who have read my books, right? Audrey, you've read my books. It sounds like this. This is the only voice I have. This is the one, whether you read the books or you hear me here. That's consistency. If I read your website and I just see keywords and keywords and keywords, you're going to lose people because not everyone comes in from a search engine. Sometimes they come in from an industry site, right? Allison is here from Guides for Brides. If I come in from there, did you keep that up to date? Are your text, your photos, your videos, your reviews up to date? Reviews are critically important because reviews show the results of doing business with you. Reviews are your brand. If I read your reviews, I should know what it's like to do business with you. People do business with people. Are they mentioning your people? Or are they mentioning your stuff? They're talking about people. They're talking about what a pleasure it was to work with you, Irwin, right? That's what they're talking about. Not just that I liked what you did, but I like working with you. And that's why they come back to you again and again and again. But photos, videos, I can't tell you how many times I'll go to someone's profile, look at, you know, look at Guys for Brides, and you look at the photo like, oh yeah, that's old. Oh yeah, we don't even do that anymore. We redecorated that room now. It doesn't even look like that. And what about your reviews? The three things that matter with reviews, the number of reviews matters, the score if there's a rating system, and then the recency. How recent are these reviews? They don't care what you did two years ago. They care what you did last weekend. My best friend's son is engaged. And he's sending me Facebook messages asking about the different suppliers. Do you know this one or that one? When it came to their venue, he sent me a link. It's in the States, so I went to the Knot. That was the Knot.com, where I used to be vice president of sales. He sent me a link. And it was a beautiful venue. But the most recent review was from 2017. What are you thinking? You still open? Right? What are you thinking? So I went to a different site, WeddingWire, and they had reviews from 2019. So they obviously pay more attention to wedding wire than the knot. But this couple sent me the link to the knot. That's what they're using. You're thinking 2017, maybe I'll find another place. Recency matters. What did you do last weekend? Not what did you do last year or the year before. Another way, social media. Now social media, you have to be careful with that because social media, we have different audiences. You're an audience for each other. Right? Don't you look at each other's things? That's one audience. But then you have an audience of your couples, or your mitzvah clients, or your corporate clients. So who are you speaking to in your social media? Who is it that you're trying to get their attention? Right? Which social platforms is your client using to find suppliers? Don't ask them which platforms they use, because they might tell you Snapchat. Great. Are they using Snapchat to find you? No. I remember this 21-year-old girl, she's sitting on a panel. It was at a, an industry event like this, and she's talking about Snapchat, 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 Snapchat. Snapchat, you got to have your Snapchat, and you got to have geotags, and she's going into all that. And I said, oh, well, I, I get it. And she loved this store, Forever 21, which is closing down now in the States, but Forever 21. And she's carrying on every day. She watches what they do, and she watches. I said, great, I get that. But why should anyone follow your wedding business? What are you doing? that's so interesting, that's so engaging, that every day they're going to be like, oh, I wonder what they're doing. Because think about the wedding industry. There's a progression. What is the first thing that they do? Should be to find their planner, right? <laughs> right? Not everybody does, but should be the first thing they do. We know the two biggest regrets they have is if they didn't have a planner and didn't have video. Those are their two biggest regrets. Right? First two articles I ever wrote for bridal magazines for couples. First was why you need video. It's called, Let's Watch Our First Dance. Oh, that's right, we can't. <laughs> I have professionally shot movies of my parents' wedding. Professionally shot in 1954. Black and white, eight millimeter movies. I don't have video of my wedding. So that's why I wrote that article. And the second article was about why you need a wedding planner. And it said, do you want to enjoy your wedding day or work it? Right? So you need both of those things there. But they're going to do their venue, right? They're going to do their venue, they're going to do the dress, they're going to go down the line. So once they've chosen their venue, are they still looking at your social media for your venue? No. So it's very ephemeral. It's there and it's gone, there and it's gone. So where are they looking for you? And you need to be where they're looking when they're looking. 
So think about those, plat those platforms. And then wedding expos. Wedding expos bring together people who are looking for suppliers. They're also called buyers. These are people that are looking for your services. Now, does everyone go to a wedding expo when they're engaged? No. But the ones that do are buyers. So when it comes to any type of advertising, any type of uh, expo, I don't want you to do to them what they do to you. What's the first question they ask you? What do they ask you? How much does it cost? Then nobody ever asks you that? Really? In the UK, no one asks how much it costs? It's the first question, right? Why do they do that? They don't know what else to ask. They don't know how to shop for what you do. If they've never done it before, which many of them have not, some of them do it again. That's nice, because you get business again, right? <laughs> they don't know what else to ask. So you do the same thing, though. Someone comes to you and says, do you want to take a stand out at my expo? Or do you want to advertise on my website or my magazine? And you say, how much does it cost? It's the wrong question. The question is, who's the audience? Who's going to see that stand? Who's going to see that ad? You should be asking that because if you don't want that audience, if it's not the right demographics, geographics, and psychographics, don't buy it. But if it is, buy the biggest, baddest placement you can get. Because why would you want to be missed? Why would you want to be in the back corner in the little tiny stand when you could be right up front? Why would you not want to be on the front page, Allison, right? You want to be right there where they're like, hey, I'm here. You can't miss me. But you do the same thing to them. How much is that ad? I don't care how much it is if I don't want those people. But if I do, then I want the best placement I can get. All right. Number two is customer testimonials. So I mentioned that already, testimonials. Testimonials describe what it's like to do business with you. Testimonials are the words and phrases that you can't use. So you can't say the things that they say because it sounds egotistical, it sounds like you're bragging, right? But they use these emotional phrases to describe it. One of my favorite phrases someone ever said about me was, you're probably the only speaker I can listen to without once looking at my watch. That was pretty good until someone who read that wrote, Alan, I was looking at my watch because I was hoping it wasn't over yet. <laughs> wait, wait, here we go. Drop the mic, okay, that's it. <laughs> I never drop a mic on the floor. That, that, that was a safe mic drop over there. But you see how those phrases describe something that I, I couldn't describe. What, what's it like to watch you speak, Alan? Uh, how, would I, how would I say that? I'm probably the only speaker you can listen to without once looking at your watch. That's a little on the nose, I think, right? <laughs> it's a little much. So the key is you can't say the thing. Seth Godin, if you don't know Seth Godin, marketing expert, read his books. What you say isn't nearly as important as what others say about you. You want your customers bragging. You want your customers saying the things that you can't say. But the key is putting it where they're already looking, not hiding it someplace else. So, where are you going to use them? On your website. However, how many of you have a testimonials page on your website? Okay, have you ever looked at your analytics report? Because nobody goes there, right? No, they don't. But think about it. Let me go to a page that you put only the best things anyone has ever said about you. Why would I go look at that page, right? Why would I look there? I know you stacked the deck. I know, did you put the bad stuff there? And of course you didn't. Nobody puts the bad stuff there. This is, the analy this is Google Analytics on my website. From January through October 27th this year, I had 28,000 page views. I have two testimonials pages on my website. One of them is for consulting reviews. One of them is for speaking. 1.8% of my website traffic and 1.4% of my website traffic are going there. Most of that is the people posting those comments because you post the comment right there. The other is me going and looking at it. <laughs> Because I respond to every review. By the way, you should respond to every review. Every good review, not just bad reviews. If you only respond to bad, it's like you're not in the room. And right? if you've never had a bad review, they think you're not paying attention. To respond to the good reviews, they know you're paying attention and engaged in the process. It lets your personality come across. So you don't want to just put them there. 
What you want to do is put them everywhere. So you want to think about these, like these speed humps on the road, right? A speed hump is what? It's just a, it's just a line, right? What do you do when you get to a speed hump? Slow down. slow down. You don't stop, right? You slow down. You slow down, you keep going. So throughout the page, I want you to think about these single lines. Now, when I say single lines, I mean short phrases. Right? I don't want the whole paragraph. You know that lovely paragraph that somebody wrote, that, real, that, that lovely book that they wrote, and you're like, oh my god, that was so nice. Nobody wants to read it, right? You don't even want to read it. You start reading it, you start scanning, because we're humans, and humans don't read, we scan. I heard recently that the average goldfish has a nine-second attention span, and the average human has an eight-second attention span. Right? We don't read, we scan. Top left to bottom right, that's how we do it here. Some other countries, top right to bottom left, that's how you do it, you scan. So don't give them the whole thing. Uh, think about this. If I wanted you to eat a whole cake and I gave you a fork full of cake, you go, oh, that's good cake. Here's another fork full. Okay. Here's another and another, right? You ever eat the whole cake that way? Yeah. Put a whole cake in front of someone with a fork and say, eat the cake. No, I'm not going to start. <laughs> right? So what you want to do is think about speed bumps. And the speed bumps, like here's a client of mine, and I want you to think mobile first. And what mobile first means is don't look at your website just on your laptop and desktop. Most of your clients, especially for weddings, are looking on mobile. This is one, eh, maybe it's two short sentences here, on a celebrant site in Washington, D.C. Right? Nice and short in the middle of the page. And then there's another one. And then there's another one. And then there's another one. How much of this screen can you see? How much of the page? Not much. So when you scroll, I want you to see another one and another. Don't put them at the bottom of the page. The bottom of the page is a black hole. Nobody ever goes there. When, when's the last time you made it to the bottom of a page on, a, on, a, on your phone on someone's website? Probably never, right? <laughs> OK. Now, in your marketing, in your marketing pieces, if you go to a wedding expo, you hand out marketing pieces. And what do they do with them? Put them in the bag. Right? And what do they do when they get home? Dump the bag out. Why should they pay attention to your piece? It's in there with how many others? Dozens of other pieces. Why should they pay attention to yours? No little tiny pieces. Big, bold, right? Show. I have these, they're not that big, but I have six, <laughs> these six inch circles. They go in a, pe in a bag, you dump it out, it's the only round thing in there. Right? Then on this piece, are testimonials, because I can't say what they say. We just had an all-day session with Alan. It was the best money I could have spent. Can I say that to you? It'll be the best money you've ever spent. I don't know. I don't know what other money you've spent. Maybe it's the first time you're having sales training, right? Maybe it will be. I hope it will be, but I can't promise that. But Angelo can say that, right? In your communications, you're emailing with people, and sometimes the best answer to why they should choose you or to their question or objection is something somebody else already said. So in this case, here's an email that I sent to someone, right? A nice short email over here, right? There's one testimonial here. Here's what just one client wrote after having me come in to work with his team. Thanks for the inspiration and the tools we needed to enhance our sales growth. And then in my signature, somebody wrote, Alan does just, doesn't just give you food for thought during his sessions, he gives you a whole feast. That's a pretty good line. I can't say that. Imagine me telling you that. I don't just give you food for thought. I give you the whole feast. <laughs> Again, a little on the nose, right? <laughs> but that's the key, is they're saying the things you can't say in a way you can't say them, and you're hiding them on a testimonials page that nobody is looking at. Put them everywhere, absolutely everywhere. Now, handling objections. Someone says to you, but yeah, but what about this? Or what about that? I was at a venue in New York City, and there's the Long Island Railroad train right next to it. I mean, like, right here. And brides will come by and say, is the train going to come by during my wedding? Yes. <laughs> yes, these are railroad tracks, and there's probably going to be a train here. Meanwhile, they come there, but, oh, but, but the train. So I always say to my clients, go to your reviews and read them are people complaining about the train. And you know what we found? Not one. Not one said the train came by during my ceremony. The train came by during the cocktails outside. Not one of them said that. 
right? I have had other people complaining about similar things. Oh, what about the road noise? What about this? There was one, I'm at a venue, and there's a, a um, in Denver, Colorado, there's a hospital. And while I'm doing a sales meeting, a helicopter came, brought somebody to the hospital. And somebody said, you know, could that happen during a wedding? Yeah, it could. Will it happen during yours? I don't know. Will anybody have a car accident on the day of your wedding? I don't know. But it is possible that could happen. But read the reviews. Is anybody complaining about helicopters? No. So if you look at your reviews and you're finding these things that people are saying are a problem, those are problems. But if they say, oh, is this going to happen or could this be a problem, go read your reviews and say, you know what? Thank you for asking. I totally understand your concern while you and I are standing here on a Tuesday afternoon and there's nothing else going on. But on the day of your wedding, it's going to be so exciting and so many visual elements and so many audible elements and so many, so many wonderful smells that the last thing they're going to be paying attention to is fill in the blank, whatever that is. So use your reviews to show that these things are not a problem. Number three is have a productive conversation. You need to have a productive conversation. A productive conversation is not you talking. A productive conversation is your customer talking. Right? I wrote a book called Why Don't They Call Me? Right? Why Don't They Call Me? It's eight tips for converting wedding and event inquiries into sales. I'm going to give you the short version because I'd be here for two hours giving you the long version. You need to reply quickly. According to a study by Wedding Wire in the States, nearly 50% of couples chose the first supplier who replied. 50%. Quickly is important. Quickly is important, but replying personally is more important. Because when you're the customer, do you love an auto reply? Do you love that reply that says, thank you very much, we've received your message, we'll get back to you as soon as we can? No, duh. Isn't that what you're supposed to do? Get back to me as quickly as you can? But your auto reply didn't give me any information. Didn't give me anything more than I already knew. But use their chosen platform. If they email you, email them back. If they text you, text them back. If they call you, call them back. If they WhatsApp you, WhatsApp them back. Smoke signals, smoke signals back. Whatever you got. Because they are choosing the method. Now you give them the choices. You go to my website, you can email me, text me, fill out a contact form, or, or ring me up. Right? What's the least likely way that somebody's going to contact me? Ring me up. Right? Texting is there for people. Not many people do it, but they can. I don't use live chat on my website because I'm not available to chat. If you have someone available, live chat is great because where are people doing a lot of their wedding planning? At work? Shocking, isn't it? <laughs> Next thing you're going to tell me they're getting married on Saturday. Whoa, here he is. <laughs> so if they're planning their wedding from work and it's about, mm, well, maybe it is, you know, half past 12 right now, and let's say they're not on lunch and the boss is not in the room, when they sneak over to your website, they can't pick up the phone and ring you, can they? Is that what the boss wants to hear? Yeah, hi, I'd like to talk about my wedding flowers now. Yeah. No, they don't want to do that. So, but they can chat with you. They can live chat with you, having a real conversation, as long as it's a real person that's answering them. Don't data dump. By the time someone reaches out to you, I want you to think about this. They've eliminated most of your competitors. Right? What do we do? We do online research. We, we, we go to Guides for Brides, we do our online research, and we are, you know Tinder? Do you know that app, Tinder, dating app? What is swipe left is the bad one? Is that the? Nobody ever wants to admit to that, I know, yeah. <laughs> but they've eliminated most of your competitors, and by the time they reach out, they're only reaching out to a handful of businesses. Because they've already said, no, 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 yeah, okay, no, yeah, okay. They reach out to you, you're in that small group, they already know th some things about you, they like what they've seen and heard, they put you on that short list, don't take them backwards. Don't start telling them things they haven't asked you because it's probably on your website, probably in your social media, probably on your, on your online ads. Why would you take me backwards and start telling me things that I probably already knew about you, which is why I reached out in the first place? Mirror their tone. Are they being formal? Are they being casual? Are they, as I'd like to inquire about our impending nuptials and engaging your services for said day? <laughs> and then you get, OMG, my BFF and I are getting married. <laughs> it's a little different. Now, you don't get a smiley face from me unless you give me one first, because I'm mirroring. Right? The same thing with tone. If you write, Dear Alan, 
I'll write, Dear Allison. But if she drops that off and says, Hi, Alan. Hi, Allison. Alan, Allison, no name, no name, done, that's it. You won't even realize it, but it feels comfortable. See, what you want to do is avoid the friction in any conversation, right? Any, any, any process with a customer, avoid the friction. We add friction. If Allison goes, hey, Alan, and I write, dear Allison, thank you so much for your inquiry, it's a little too formal, and that adds friction to the process. Similarly, if they email you and you want to get them on the phone right away, you're asking for a phone call, is a high commitment action. A high commitment action adds friction. My wife and I were shopping for a certain type of insurance. I filled out a contact form. The next day, salesperson called me. Okay, I didn't ask for a phone call, but that's fine. I, I, I didn't have to answer, I did. She immediately wanted to come to our home and have a meeting with my wife and I. My inside voice was, back off, lady. <laughs> I didn't ask you to come to my house. I asked for a quote on insurance. You don't have to come to my house to give me a quote on insurance. And she said, well, the way I like to do it, the way... Who likes to do it? Who's the customer here? This is all my inside voice. And I said, I understand, but it's not convenient for me. I travel extensively. Better for me through phone and email. And she tried one more time, and I said, put on my nicest smile. Can you hear if someone's smiling on the phone? Yes, you can. And I said, I understand if this doesn't work for you this way. Is there someone else I can speak to? Oh, she backed off quick. I'm still not doing business with her, though, because every point, there was always that friction. She sent me a quote, and I said, could you make a little change? She said, well, that's why I like to meet with you. Mm. There's a saying in the States down south. It's a wonderful saying. It erases almost everything bad you could say to someone. It's called, bless your heart. <laughs> that is the ugliest baby. Bless its heart. <laughs> Really, it's, it's, a, it's a total eraser. You can erase everything there, right? Adam, right? That you can, just, that's it. It doesn't erase everything. Well, bless her heart. She was trying, but somebody else made it easy. Somebody else emailed back and forth, gave me the quotes I wanted, made the changes I needed, and no friction. Reduce the friction in the process. Mirror how much they write. Some people write you sound bites. You don't even get punctuation. You ever have those people? They don't know that there's a shift key. There is no capital letter, there is no period, it's just one continuous, right? I don't mirror that. I still write the way I'm gonna write, but if they write me a book, they've given me permission to write them back a book. Doesn't mean you have to, but they've given you permission. If they write you short and you write them a book, they're not reading it. How many of you have done this? You go to your phone, you get an email, and you're like, yeah. Mark that unread, go back to it. Yeah, you ever do that? Do you want your clients doing that? No. You want them reading it now at work under the desk. Because that's what they're doing. You email them at, at one in the afternoon. What are they doing? They're reading it under the desk. They'll read and respond to the short email if you end it with one question. Two important parts to that. End it with one question. Not two, not three, not four, not five. You want them to answer a question, end it with one question. You write them an email, make a new paragraph with the question, because they're going to scan, they're not going to read, so they'll see the question. If you bury your question, if you write a question and, and then keep writing, it's like being on the phone with someone saying, hey, you know, let's say I ask Joe a question. So Joe, you know, what do you think about this? And then, and, then, and then I just keep talking. And he's thinking, are you going to give me a chance to answer? Right? It's the same thing. If you write a question, you keep writing, you've buried the question, they're not going to answer it. You ever have you ask someone three questions, they answer the last one? Right, because they didn't read, they scanned, they saw the last one, that's the one they answer. So end it with one question. Okay, number four is care enough to really listen. They're coming to you because they think you can give them the outcome they want. They're coming to you because they want the results that they feel you can provide. Hopefully only you, but maybe you and a handful of people. So care enough to really listen. Theodore Roosevelt said, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Can you tell if someone's really paying attention to you? Right? Can you tell if they're just talking and they're not really listening to what you're doing? You ever have a salesperson doing that? They're telling you about certain features and benefits and you're like, I don't care. I, I just don't care about that. And they're just going on and on because they think it's important. It's not important to me if it's not important to you. It has to be important to them. So. Ask better questions. 
I, w I was talking before with a gentleman who's got some venues. He said he, was, listen, he loves this book that I wrote, Shut Up and Sell More. The story behind this book very simply is, I learned how to sell more when I learned how to talk less, which is a really hard thing in my family because talking is a competitive sport in my family. <laughs> right. So asking a better question is going to get you a better answer. Let them talk. If you're having a meeting with someone and you're talking in the beginning, that meeting's not going well because you're not finding out anything new. Every time you speak, everything you say, you already know. Are you learning anything new? No. Are you going to say anything and go, oh, I didn't know that? No. You're going to learn when you listen to them. Number five is to create the excitement and the anticipation. If you don't sound excited every time you're speaking with a client, they're not going to be excited. If they come to you excited about this event that they're throwing, whether it's a kid's birthday party or a wedding or a mitzvah or a corporate event, you have to be just as excited. I have a client in the, in the States. She, she has her venue for 25 years. She said every time she sends a bride down the aisle, 25 years, she gets a little tear. She gets a little, it's like her, like, that's my niece, right? And she said the day comes where I don't get a little teary, I'm done. Because they chose her. How many venues could they have chosen? Hundreds, but they chose her. How many florists do they have at their wedding? You. How many photographers? You, right? That's it, they chose you. You should be just as excited that they chose you because if you're not, you shouldn't take that job. And if you never get excited, you shouldn't be in this industry. It should be exciting. Sell the, sell the heart, don't sell the head. The head has a budget. You don't want to sell the head. <laughs> you want to sell the heart because the heart has no budget. Right? Do you ever buy something that was more than you wanted to spend because your heart was like, I want it. Your head's like, you shouldn't buy that. Your heart's like, I want it. Kind of like that angel devil thing going on there, right? It's like, yes, what I want. I think we've all been there, right? Sell their heart. The heart wants the outcome. The heart wants the results. The head's going to go, all right, if you want it, there you go. Number six is... Present customized solutions. If the customer comes to you and says, I want this, 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 and this, and you give them just this, this, and this, this, somebody else could have done that. It's just fulfilling an RFP. That, that, that's not why they need you. They already knew what they needed. Now they just need you to do that. Is that exciting? No, it's exciting when you give them a customized solution, right? They don't want the products and services. They want the results of those products and services. Customized solutions. There's a great book called The Challenger Sale. I'll get out of the way. The Challenger Sale, which one of my clients was funny. He had never read the book. He heard about it. He said, you're coming to do sales training for my team. Teach him about this book. I had to go read the book. And what it basically says is when the customer comes to you and says, here's what I want, you say, oh, I hear what you're saying. But, but what about this? Or last year when Cece Johnson spoke here, she said the qu her question is always, what if? Yeah, I hear you. What if we did this? And you want them to go, oh, I never thought of that. Right, because if you thought about it, you didn't need me. <laughs> Somebody else can fulfill that list, but you need me because of the what if. And if they're competing you against someone else and you give them the good what ifs, they have to go with you because it's your what if, not somebody else's. So challenge them, that whole idea of the title, challenge them on their assumptions, challenge them on the results and say, what if we went here? Right? Number seven is assume the close. If you've gotten through the process where you got their attention, you got the inquiry, you've had a good conversation, you have to assume that they're going to buy. You have to speak to them as if they're going to buy. Because if you don't, they're not going to buy. It's not up to the customer to say, yeah, let's do it. It's up to you to ask. So the first thing I want you to think about is, they came to you. How many of you are doing cold calling? Right? You're cold calling people, for, no, right? Nobody's doing it cold calling. When I started in this industry, I was cold calling. Actually, I was cold calling you guys. I would get in my car and drive around, and I would see a shop, a flower shop, a venue, a, a, a photographer, and I'd go knocking on doors. That was cold calling. Now, I knew you were in the industry, but that's all I knew. I didn't know if you were interested. Your clients come to you. They call you, they email you, they ring you up, and they say, I need what you do. That's a pretty good starting point. I like that starting point, right? It's much better than what I used to do. So they came to you, be confident, right? 
That was one of your C's, wasn't it? Be confident. Why should you be confident? Because confidence sells. People do business with confident people, not cocky. There's a fine line between confident and cocky. Confident is, I am prepared, I can do this, I know how to get this done. Cocky is like, I got this. But the cocky people don't do the work. The confident people know that they can do it because they've done the work. They're coming to you because they want what you do. They want those results. So talk about the results that they want. If you're really listening and you're talking about the results they want, everything else will fall into place because they're not going to ask you, where are you getting those tables from? <laughs> they're not asking that. Uh, how are you going to set that flatware? You know, is that going to be you know, four millimeters? They're not going to ask you. They're going to assume that you're going to get those details right. They're going to ask you about the details they care most about. The rest of it is just magically going to happen because you're going to have your fairies come in and wave their wands, right? Isn't that what you do? Yeah. But as far as they're concerned, you do because they don't care. I remember being in a hotel ballroom at uh, one time with a National Speakers Association conference. And I watched them turn the room from 1,500 people theater style to 1,500 on um, banquet rounds. And I watched them turn that room. And I said, you know what? Everybody who was sitting in one of those chairs left and went into a breakout session. They were going to come back in and sit down for lunch in the same room. These tables weren't here. These linens weren't here. These dishes weren't here. And they're going to sit down and they're going to have lunch and give zero thought to how that happened. And I watched the army. You guys know what it looks like, right? I watched that army rolling tables in and bringing, moving chairs around and bringing in the linens and all that. I watched that happen. It's like, they're not going to give any thought to that unless it doesn't happen. It's like no one's going to look at the chandelier and go, every light bulb is working. But one bulb is out. What are they doing? They're looking everywhere for every other bulb is out. We don't get credit for getting it right. We lose points for getting it wrong. You're all looking at the chandeliers now. <laughs> <laughs> Made you look, okay. But isn't it true? Nobody ever says, hey, thanks for having all the bulbs work. No. Hey, thanks for having all the chairs in the right places. Nobody says that. But one is wrong. Now you have a problem. They pay you to get it right. And that's what they want is the results. And then you have to ask for the sale. You have to ask them if this is the results they want. If they want you to bring that magic to them, you have to ask for the sale. And the key is not really selling them anything because they came to you because they needed it. The key is to help them buy. They were already a buyer when they came to you. They already have ideas and you're going to give them more ideas and challenge their assumptions. So don't sell them anything. Just help them buy because they came ready to buy. They came because they want the results. And then I'm going to give you one more C. Actually, two more C's. I know I said it was seven, seven C's. Then you get to collect the cash. <laughs> Those are the good C's, right? Then we got that one. So the key here is customer comes to you. Be confident. You know your product. You know your services. You know what you can deliver. Listen to the results they want. Use their words back. Repeat their words. If they're talking about they want it to be fun, don't talk about elegant. They're talking about fun. You're talking about fun. We're having fun. You know how much fun we're going to have? We're going to have a lot of fun. <laughs> but if they're talking about how they want it to be elegant or rustic or chic or elegantly rustic chic, and then you don't know what they want, right? <laughs> but use their words because their words, when they hear it back, they're like, ah, she gets me, right? But if you use that friction, fun and elegant is friction, right? Use their words. It's like, ah, you know exactly what I'm looking for. Does that make sense? Terrific. Thank you so much. <laughs> you time? Thank you, Alan. Um, any questions? Hi, Alan. Uh, Hi. Great speech again. I saw it last year, and thank it was even better this year. Thank you. So thank you. You can put that on your website as well. Um, um, I was just wondering, how do you, have you got any tips for, uh, obviously you say buyers come to us and they you know, mm. potentially want to buy from us, but what do we do or how do we sort of pry information out of clients who necessarily don't know what they want, but they right. know they want something right. and it's sort of that balance of not giving them a sales pitch and mm -hmm. scaring them off, but right. sort of how do we pry information out of them? Right. So the client comes to you. And what is your business? A planner. Planner. The client comes to you. One of the great questions to ask them then would be, what brought you to me? 
What was it that attracted you to me? Now, it might be a referral, but it could have been a photo on your website. It could have been a photo on Pinterest or Instagram. By the way, I think we should lobby Pinterest that they should put price tags on all those pictures. Would that be good? <laughs> yeah, because they come to you and you're like, oh, your whole budget, right? Or Johnny, would you say the whole budget was 70,000, right? And the pictures on our Pinterest were 300,000, so yeah, right? But then you don't say, do you want this? You say, what is it about that that you like? Right? Ask them the question. Do you, do, you have a, say, do you have a Pinterest board for your inspiration? And if she says yes, no matter how much you hate Pinterest, you say, can we see it? Put the good smile on. Because they're going to show you what they want it to look like. And when you know the budget doesn't match, you say, what is it about that that you like? Okay? What have you seen at other weddings and events that you absolutely want at yours? What have you seen at other weddings and events that you absolutely don't want at yours? Those are the more important ones because those are the ones you'll start suggesting things and they're like, I don't want that, right? They'll tell you about the centerpiece that they couldn't see through so they couldn't see the people on the other side or they'll tell you about the chairs that were uncomfortable, right? They'll tell you those things because if somebody's getting married, Aren't usually their friends getting married, their sisters, their cousins, right? They fall like dominoes. They've been to other weddings. Start asking them questions like that so you can try to paint a picture. Thank you. Uh, hi, Ellen. I'm Chloe with, with Elegant Entertainment. Um, we just wanted to ask, with an industry like ours, we, uh, when we go to bride expos and things like that, we get given a database of about 900 people who are potentially interested. How do you blanket email them or get in touch with them without making it sound so generic and not like you, you care about the attention? Great question. I actually do a presentation on, on wedding expos. Six steps for wedding expo success. The key with it is... They come to the expo because they're buyers, but they may not be in the market for your service yet, right? If they don't have their venue, you're, you're a little further down the line, right? Because they can't book you until they have the date. Although they'd probably come to you sometimes and say, we'd love to book you, what's the date? Well, we haven't booked the venue yet, right? You can't, can't book them. They don't realize that. So the key is, there's four lists that you should end up with after a wedding expo. Sales that you made. If you're not trying to make sales in an expo, you're not going to make any sales because you get what you expect. So how could you make a sale at an expo? Well, possibly someone that you had a conversation with, but they haven't booked yet. They show up at the expo. Be prepared to take a contract, take a deposit. Okay? Second list, people you made appointments with. Right? So you're at the expo, and now you made an appointment for a phone call, an in-person meeting, a Skype call, or whatever it is. The third list, you had a conversation, but you didn't get to the meeting. They wouldn't schedule the meeting. And then the fourth list is the rest of those 900 people. All right, so the contracts, obviously, you take them off the 900 list. You have a meeting with them, you take them off the 900 list. The people you have a meeting with, you need to follow up because some of those people will not show up for their meetings. It just happens. So make sure you get a Google Calendar or something into them so they know they're supposed to have it. Follow up to keep their meeting. The third list is the people you didn't have a meeting with, but you had a conversation. You should have notes maybe where they're getting married, things like that. Follow up personally with each of them. And then the master list, you want to send them to a page on your website that is specifically for this wedding expo. So don't send them to your homepage. That's like stepping them backwards. What do you already know? Well, they came to the wedding expo, so if you do, do you do more than just weddings? Do you, right, so don't send me to your homepage where I have to choose weddings from all those other things, send me to you a page that specifically, thank you for coming to the expo at the Savoy, right? And then you'll have a short contact form on that page, maybe a picture of your stand, not empty, people in it, right? Show them that people wanted to talk to you. If you have to stage it, get your friends to come into the stand and take that picture. But at that expo, the, oh, I remember that one. That had the purple and the tangerine, right? Was that, right, John? It was the purple and tangerine stand, right? But they'll be, oh, I remember that now. And then there's a call to action. And if you're making a, an offer at the expo, have that offer on that page. So that page is self-contained. And it can be what's called a hidden page on your website, which means I can't get there without that link. And therefore, if you're making an offer that you don't want everybody else to see, you can send them over there. So if you do that, about 10% of the suppliers who exhibit at an expo will use the list. 10%. That means just using it puts you ahead of the game. And then you want to use it as quickly as possible, follow up personally, and then do it ag again. Now, subject line, last part about this. We decide which emails to open based upon the subject line and who it's from. So what would be your subject line on your email to the 900 people? 
So your wedding entertainment, right? Yes. All right. So what if it said, what if it said your packed dance floor starts here? Okay, your wedding or your packed wedding dance floor starts here. Or it'll be music to your ears. Right? Something different than thanks for coming to the expo, because they're gonna get a dozen of those. Same thing when you're sending out any email. Someone follows, fills out your contact form on your website, don't send back wedding inquiry. That's your subject line, right? Make them open it. Uh, one of my favorite subject lines, I have a client in, in the States, they have ships that they do weddings on. So they're in uh, San Francisco and New York and LA and other places. And if they get in a wedding inquiry, the subject line is, oh ship, you're getting married. <laughs> Got your attention? Yes, first step, get their attention. Great. Do we have any other questions? Yep. Stuart. Hi, Alan. Stuart Wood, photographer, as you know. Uh, I've got every one of your audio books, which is absolutely, uh, they're all amazing. I listen to them all the time. I wrote a new book, but it's not an audio oh, yet. Okay. 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 <laughs> or as we say, very, absolutely brilliant. So, okay. uh, yes. Uh, but, uh, and I've listened to them a lot, and also what you've said today. Mm -hmm. Just a little question. We're a bit more reserved in, Brit in Britain, mm -hmm. you know. I'm talking about not me so much as my clients. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just wondering if I follow your advice mm -hmm. to the letter, etc. am I going to come across with a British audience that's a little bit more right. uh, sort of uh, pushy, right. which I don't want to, obviously. Understood. Mm -hmm. And it's a great question because I've spoken in 14 countries, and I hear this a lot. And then the people that try it tell me when you make it your own, it works. Not doing it because we don't do that is a pretty bad reason for, for not trying it. The thing is to make it your own. I, I sometimes play the role of the arrogant American, which if you knew arrogant Americans, you would think this is not an arrogant American. Assertive and confident, not aggressive. That's the key. So your messaging inside could be very British whatever that means. <laughs> but it should actually be very Stuart, is what it should be, because it should be you. Just like when I do it, it's going to be me. But humor, again, don't, don't cross the line into non-PC humor, right? Humor is good, because it gets people's attention. Asking them to do something, asking a question, right? So you'll make a very British, apologize first, and then ask for the question, right? <laughs> is, that, is that how you do it, right? right? I, 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 don't, I never hear I'm sorry so much as I do here and in Ireland. It's like everything is like, sorry, sorry, sorry. And then ask the question and then they'll do it. I've had people in every country I've been to who said they've tried it and it works. But you just have to make it your own. The key is not, you don't want to sound like me. You want to sound like you. But if you don't ask a question, they're not going to answer. They're not going to reply. If you have any other questions, come and see me. But thanks again. Thanks for Thank you, me. Alan. A brilliant session. Brilliant. Thank you.